And uh, I am here today for our fourth, fifth, fifth weekly constitutional with Hal Fusen and Abe Ordover. Now, Hal is uh, actually, a, you are a First Amendment lawyer. That's Well, that is true, technically. I am actually a retired newspaper lawyer. I did, I did teach a media law for a few years and early in my career. And uh, a good part of my practice before I retired was First Amendment related. Uh, and, I, and once you get into this sort of thing, you know, you kind of get stuck with it. And we seem to keep finding First Amendment issues that get sort of shoved down our throats, whether we want to just take a nap or not. <laughs> yes, well, it's funny how pesky the First Amendment can be. Words, you know, words are like that. All words. Yes, that is that is so true. I we were talking about my husband Andrew. Abe, do you remember the the play that he wrote about um, Oliver North trying Oliver North to determine whether he should or should not be allowed into the pantheon of American heroes? <laughs> Which I think he did. I think he did the play at Emory Law School while you were teaching there, Abe. He did. Well, one well, of the you know I produced his I produced his plays at Emory Law School. Right, and he and he had an actual jury. And how one of the things that was interesting right. for me reading it was that he had um, Aaron Burr as the uh, pro as the defense, and he had Young Jefferson as the prosecution. Mm. Aaron Burr put old Jefferson on the stand <laughs> and anything that was said on the stand was actually a quote from something that these guys had written or something that came out of a letter or a speech or something like that. So you have Jefferson, young Jefferson, this idealist saying, you know, you know, freedom of speech and freedom of the press and all this stuff is really important. And then you get old Jefferson on the stand and he's like, I hate newspapers. <laughs> Well, you know, you, you got to be, as Abe and I both can recognize, uh, you, you got to be subject to a little bit of malleability over the years. Um, you, 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 uh, you learn from your experiences, I guess, or you just get less able to tolerate uh, the kinds of things that you should. Um, some of them, some of us, of course, go the other direction. And maybe Abe's one of those, but I get grumpy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I started off grumpy, so I had to, to go. <laughs> I think you, I think you earn grumpiness actually as you. I'm getting grumpier yeah. as I go. Definitely, yeah, well, it's a chevron. It's a chevron. You wear it on your sleeve. It's, it's important. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Well, it, it's interesting. You you uh, you mentioned Aaron Burr, uh, uh, who you know was famous for being a vice president of the United States and also fighting fighting duels. Yes. Uh, and, and actually killing people in those duels, one of whom is now, speaking of producers, um, yes, cleaning up on Broadway. On Broadway. Uh, <laughs> right. um, but speech is par part of the reason for free speech is to mitigate things like duels. Uh, mm -hmm. Instead of having to shoot it out in Weehawken, uh, we we protected our ability to talk it out um and and in that sense i think we've progressed somewhat over the last few hundred years though then i look at the news some days and think maybe we haven't maybe not so much <laughs> is it was it that we were trying to uh, make it possible to talk it out or to to protect ourselves from having someone push push us in a in a more violent direction well i think there's freedom to and freedom from i guess is where i'm yes. because that's actually one of my upcoming questions huh. well ask it <laughs> <laughs> well it it goes along i actually i went through the the our first amendment in the bill of rights and I looked at where the semicolons were. And so you mm -hmm. have establishment of religion mm -hmm. or prohibiting the free exercise of religion. And then you have abridging the freedom of speech or of the press, which mm -hmm. makes it sound like it's personal speech and official journalistic speech. 
And then you have the right of the people to peaceably assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. And it's it's interesting the way that Madison, I'm assuming this was written by Madison, didn't he? He did all the first 10 at least. Um, well, there, it's not totally clear, but certainly no, Madison deserves as much credit as any individual. Uh, um, well, you got to remember that uh, the first the language of the First Amendment is a product of lawmaking. Mm. It's um, not not a whole lot different than writing uh, the the bill that constitutes Obamacare, in the sense that you make a lot of choices and you trade here and trade there. Mm -hmm. I mean, the whole notion of having a a Bill of Rights was um, a controversial part of the effort to put together a lasting constitution. Um, and so it's, it's not like you could sit down and say, um, well, I want a perfect uh, healthcare system. Mm -hmm. And obviously those are available, at least very, very good ones, but I can't sell it to my, to my fellow members of Congress. Right. So I'll go with something that's compromised. Um, this, you know, there's, there's a, we, we First Amendment folks like to believe that the First Amendment is first for a reason, but that's not true. It simply uh, happens to be randomly placed at the top of the list. Right. Um, and certainly when you look at that language, you come away with a feeling that there's something there that's be, that goes beyond the exact words. And, it, and I think it goes toward what you were just suggesting, that um, it's about people's ability to believe mm -hmm. and right to believe and the right to talk about what they believe and the right to um, advocate for what they believe. Um, and so we put together this particular set of clauses, uh, Madison, and in the political environment in which he was operating, um, that captured um, really an enlightenment view of the right. role of uh, speech in uh, making a democracy work or a republic work. And there are differences between republics and democracies, obviously, but nobody's quite figured out what we are. Uh, <laughs> That's right. <laughs> We're still yeah. working on that. Yeah. yeah let, let me ask you, Heather raised this uh, issue before we went on the air. Um, let me put it in a slightly different way. What were the rights of Englishmen, of English citizens in Britain um, at about this time? Well, it, was pretty, it, it was pretty clear that uh, the right to avoid prior restraint was part of British law. Um, you, you, you couldn't mm -hmm. do things, um, well, you could do lots of things that didn't involve using a legal apparatus, uh, shooting someone, for example. Uh, <laughs> um, little things. Uh, you, could, you could do little things like that, but the, the operation of law was limited by a general principle uh, opposing prior actions to stop somebody from speaking. If they did speak, however, they could be liable for whatever they said in a way that we wouldn't tolerate today. Were there libel laws and slander laws the same way that there are now, or was it just kind of a, a blanket? No, there, there were libel laws and, and, and slander. Uh, I am, uh, I'm not a legal scholar. Uh, and I, I've thought a lot about the history of the First Amendment over the years, and mostly that just confuses me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, things, things that uh, it would be uh, easy to be very definite about um, become more difficult for me to be definite about. Um, there's a lot we don't know about why the First Amendment came to exist and what it was intended by the Founding Fathers to do. That's one of the problems with uh, the view of, that's associated with Justice Scalia, perhaps yeah. unfairly. Uh, that we're just supposed to, as a Supreme Court, as a, as a legal system, we're just supposed to interpret what the, um, what the language says and not go beyond it. 
Well, that's fundamentally impossible, which Justice Scalia, in his own opinions, demonstrated many times. I don't mean to say that he was uh, uh, hypocritical or uh, he, he, he had an approach to the language that was different than other justices might have and uh, was perhaps more keyed to the exact language. Um, but, um, but he too recognized that, you know, what do we do about iPhones? Right. Uh, uh, what are, how do we apply the first amendment to movies? I mean, you know, he, he understood the challenges. And in fact, he was, of all of the, the justices who, who have served in, in recent years, he may have been the most absolutist about certain aspects of freedom of speech. Uh, and that sort of was driven by, or arguably was driven by um, his sensitivity to the language of the First Amendment. That's very interesting well, because sensitivity uh, isn't, sensitivity to language isn't something that I would have um, put in the same sentence with Justice Scalia. But I, but now that I'm seeing the language, I'm starting to see the language differently because of the con conversations that I've been having with Abe. Mm -hmm. I, I, what you said makes a lot more sense to me now than it would have a month ago. Hmm. How, how the, the language, <laughs> the language in the first amendment that deals with petitioning and grievances, uh, um, uh, freedom of assembly. Um, my assumption, again, I'm, I'm not a First Amendment scholar either. But my assumption is that those were rights that that Englishmen really did not have. That that grew out of the uh, the unrest that ultimately became the American Revolution. Uh, that makes logically that makes perfect sense. Uh, I think the, the picture in my mind of Englishmen uh, gathering in London to protest the king. Uh, uh, or, seen, or commerce, like or a very un, unlikely scene to me. The, um, well, and they got beaten badly, as I recall, in the early part of the 1800s. They were with the Luddites and all the mills and everything. The the people who were protesting got beat down pretty badly because they weren't allowed to. Um, as far as Jane in, Eyre. In, in, England? in England, in England, yeah, up by right, where okay. the Bronte family lived, where the some of the mills were. I know I was reading when we did Jane Eyre that the the guys who would go out together and and protest got got beat down and killed some more than and, once. And, and and yet they did go out and protest. And, and they continued to. Yes, and they continued. Well, they, to. they were starving, so yeah. Um, and well, and, you know. Again, to the labor movement, of course, that happens in the United States, despite the First Amendment. Uh, there were all, all manner of ways to get around. The courts got around the First Amendment um, in dealing with labor disputes when uh, protesting or striking workers right. certainly were beat down by, uh, uh, by people opposed to their position, companies opposed to their position without regard to the First Amendment. I mean, you know, there are lots of arguments that can be made. This wasn't government. And, Actually, know, these, that's that's an uh, interesting question, though. How was the when when it was a a company instead of the government? When it wasn't a standing army or a political wing police. or the the police force? Thank you. Um, doing the the beatdowns. Mm -hmm. That seems like it would get kind of squishy because it, then it it's the government. It, honestly, it is. I mean, after all, if you start with the first word, Congress, shall, mm -hmm. make no shall make no law. It doesn't say that an employer can't enforce um, uh, whatever rules he or she wants to on the, on the speech of his or her employees. And in fact, there are uh, uh, colleges and universities, for example, can have uh, speech codes uh, unless they happen to be government colleges or universities, right. then they, then that's right. a little even trickier still. Um, and people, you know, you can't, you can't go into your workplace and advocate for anything you want to without being sanctioned by your employer, uh, uh -huh. or at least risking that. And the first amendment doesn't protect you. Now the, the, the conceptual thing, you know, free speech is good for all of us. 
uh, at all times in all places. That that may be a principle we can we can hold out, uh, but it's not a principle that's enforced by the First Amendment. Mm. Uh, and so, when you look at this, when you look at social forces, there's always a tendency to um, not fully take into account things that we don't think of as government uh, in determining what speech gets allowed and what speech gets listened to. Does the government have a responsibility to protect the people um, from, uh, from say, a corporation, which is one of the things I talked about last week was the, the Thorovian, <clears throat> a corporation has no conscience, but a corporation of men does have a conscience. Does the does the government have any responsibility to protect us from those corporations when they inhibit our our ability to speak out against something that they're doing? Um, well, it, the devil's kind of in the details. Uh, mm. I mean, there are things <clears throat> like whistleblower protection laws that um, exist in different contexts. The details of which are certainly beyond my. Uh, current knowledge, but um, you uh, quite often, well, take government employees, take, take mm. the kind of people within the government who have from time to time risked a great deal by leaking documents. Take Edward Snowden, for example. Right. Um, there, was, there is no, he had no legal right to do what he did that comes from the First Amendment. Um, he might have had a moral right, uh, right. Some people might claim they have a moral right to kill each other, um, but uh, he definitely did not have a First Amendment right to violate uh, his uh, his rules that were very clearly set forth when he accepted the employment that he had, and ah. which he agreed to follow. That doesn't mean I think he did the wrong thing. Right. Uh, no, but it's but that's an important thing because I don't think people understand. I don't think people understand necessarily the difference. But and it goes back to the the Nazis protesting in Skokie. Skokie. There's the there's the mor the moral side of it. You know, I find what they believe in reprehensible for all these different reasons. But in our country, they still have the right to say those reprehensible things. And mm -hmm. Snowden crossed a line on, that was spelled out in a document that he had signed whether yes. or not it was a moral thing for him to do or not he there was that line that was drawn very clearly mm -hmm. which and was he crossed it and he did and that yes. that was something that i remember at the time wrestling with i think the same way that that abe you probably wrestled with the the skokie stuff it's that it's i support the aclu and they really tick me off sometimes but mm -hmm. i really support right. the aclu yeah, I still have my card. But <laughs> I uh, every time I get a bill, we should all have. I, I debate whether yeah. to pay it or not. And yes, uh, but I always pay it. Yeah, yeah. I've always. I think it says on the card how many years I've been paying it. It's a long bloody time. Wow, and, um, that's really cool. <laughs> of course, the alternative. The alternative is terrible. How we're not going to discuss that. No. With my birthday <laughs> coming up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But hey, you I look was, marvelous. I was 72 years old yesterday. Wow, happy birthday. Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations. I will be 80 next week. Yeah. Oh, you guys are far too good for your age. <laughs> yeah, I, right. I feel like I'm... Just, just, don't, just don't ask us to run uphill. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I'm with you. <laughs> I sit at the computer all the time. I'm not going to go any faster. That's well. Getting back to getting back to this topic, I, I mean, there's so much complication with this during the period, let's say, of expansion mm -hmm. of of First Amendment rights. We had a whole area of cases uh, involving um, universities primarily, but some companies also, and to the extent that they are uh, receiving public money. Mm -hmm. For one program or another, uh, there are cases that hold that certain actions that they engage in, usually ones that deny somebody's speech or ability to associate, that that can be government action because they're receiving 
the taxpayer's money. And how far you carry that is, as Hal said before, is really a, is very fact sensitive. But there are a whole range of cases that broadened our understanding of what, what government consists of uh, in this context that, uh, that nobody thought about in, uh, in 1789. Um, um, or even or, 1889. Yes, yes. yes. I mean, uh, it, you know, it, it's just, worth noting. It's to the problems. It's worth noting that the modern law of the First Amendment really dates from the 20th century. Um, and, you know, the, the recognition that Congress, the, the, the word in, in, in the language, uh, didn't just uh, restrict Congress, it also restricted state governments. Mm. Um, doesn't say anything in there about state legislatures. And frankly, um, uh, I don't think they intended uh, to limit the states when they wrote the First Amendment. But then they came along with the Civil War and right. um, enacted the 14th right. Amendment and the other civil post-Civil War amendments to the Constitution that imposed on the states some of the uh, requirements that other constitutional provisions originally only directed at um, at the federal government. I mean, folks were worried about the federal government. They were trying to form a more perfect union um, in 1789, and the big the the opposition was was in the hands of people who thought the states should really have the real power. Mm -hmm. and, Absolutely. And what's happened is that um, as society has changed, as technology has developed, as burdens have shifted around that used to be, I mean, it used to be perfectly okay to die in the streets if you didn't get enough food. We no longer think that's uh, an appropriate uh, way for a modern society to operate. So government- Some of us. Yeah, well, some of us. Um, the, the ones that are worth listening to, um, <laughs> um, and, and so, um, we've looked to government to, to make sure that people don't die in the streets. And we've, we've looked to government to make sure that, um, uh, workplace rules, uh, protect people from hazardous occupations. Uh, you can argue about how far those rules ought to go. And argument, of course, is at the core of the First Amendment. Um, <laughs> right. But, but there's really very little, despite all of the whining by uh, people who think Ayn Rand was right, um, the, the, the consensus of the American people is that we don't let people just die in the streets right. because they don't get good health care. They don't get enough to eat. Um, that doesn't mean that can't happen. It does happen in, in it's always probably going to happen somewhere, somehow, but we have a responsibility as a society to tackle those problems and head off those kinds of deaths. Uh, in that kind of environment, the protection of free speech becomes a somewhat different question than it might have been in 1789. And if you, if you want to look at the history of the modern understanding of what the First Amendment means, it starts really with World War I. Um, really? And the laws that were passed in World War I to punish speech uh, that was basically anti-war speech and also to chase down radicals, uh, right. many, of, many of whom were uh, regarded as aliens, whether they were citizens or not. Many of the same kinds of tensions that affect society today affected us during the course of World War I. And an increasing number of cases came to the Supreme Court at the end of World War I and into the 1930s in which uh, the, the Supreme Court began to develop this notion that the First Amendment not only uh, protected citizens from the federal government, it also protected citizens from actions by state governments. And, and the court finally uh, was near against Minnesota, wasn't it? Uh, a, I always get these cases yeah. confused, finally said flatly, Congress includes legislatures. Mm. So yeah. um, uh, that was an a, a important developmental period when Justice Holmes, Justice Brandeis, 
and a number of other justices on the court went back and forth quite a bit about what the rules ought to be. But by the 1930s, had, had set a course um, that is still uh, dominant um, and I think is driven by the nature of the society in which we live and the expectations that we as citizens of this society have for how people ought to behave themselves. That's, um, that's interesting. I didn't, it never occurred to me that World War I would have been such a turning point. I knew, I knew things shifted uh, before, during, and after the Civil War. And I knew about the 50s, the late 40s and early 50s, um, with the rise of the House of Un American Activities yeah. Committee stuff. But World War I... Oh, it was, a, it was a very ragged time. My, mm. uh, I have a, one of my ancestral lines is German. And I had a, an uncle, a great uncle, I guess, my grandmother's brother, um, who was killed in World War I mm. uh, fighting for the United States. Um, and his family would have known a lot of prejudice mm -hmm. uh, because of their German roots. Right. Um, sure. And, and that's, it was that kind of context that led the, uh, led to the passage of certain kinds of laws and then controversies over whether those laws were appropriate and how they should be interpreted. And are that's these, what, I'm sorry, right. finish. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, are these, are these laws the roots of what wound up, and I'm putting in air quotes, allowing Roosevelt to create the internment camps? Was it this? Well, war is limitation on free, free speech. The internment camps are uh, certainly a, an interesting question and they are a first amendment issue. Yes, they are. Uh, I mean, the, the, these people were, um, I mean, you can't even say they were put in internment camps because of their beliefs. Most of them were uh, outspoken patriots. Yes. Um, but there was, That's right. there was this and, fear. And prove that. Yeah. With, right. Over and uh, over. Yeah. And prove that with, their, well, you had the very famous uh, uh, military uh, units made it composed of Japanese American citizens. It were uh, 4th and 42nd uh, Battalion. Uh, they were placed in internment camps because they were Japanese, they were placed in terms of cancer I because of an overriding fear among uh, the American people after Pearl Harbor. That, especially uh, California. Um, yeah. <laughs> particularly here, that we were, uh, that among them, an argument that resonates with some today, that among this substantial group of people, there were going to be uh, spies, terrorists, uh, uh, people who would take arms against the United States and in favor of, of some ancestral homeland. Uh, and, and, you know, interestingly enough, of course, we hear the same arguments now about... Uh, uh, so was, was know, we were talking about immigration the United States? Syria. Were you taking, excuse me, I didn't hear that. Heather. What did you say? I, I, you said, it, and I think it was really interesting because you said that the fear was that they were taking, that they had the potential to take arms against the United States. And yes, all of a sudden that makes me looking i'm looking at the first amendment again and thinking does that mean it was interpreted as uh, taking arms would have been an act of speech is that how this ties in how to the, no, the no. first amendment no because all it, sorts it of weird things seem to yeah it, it, it is i mean the problem with the internment camps i think goes far beyond the first amendment mm. um sure and um it certainly had a, a First Amendment aspect to it, um, but it wasn't a. It, it they came about because of the fear of the other, mm -hmm. um, and just as my uh, my grandmother's generation, uh, she was born in the United States, but her parents were born in Germany. Just as fear of those that those people might take arms mm -hmm. led to, uh, there were no internment camps, but there was an Espionage Act passed, and there was, uh, frankly, a Sedition Act passed as part yep. of that. Right. And, um, and, and so that was directed at their speech. 
in, in the case of the internment camps, uh, it, it wasn't just directed at their speech. It was directed at their freedom. They were right. locked up and put away uh, where they couldn't do any harm to us. That was, yeah. that's what we were doing. Uh, it uh, came under powers, under the War Powers Act and, and things of that kind. But, uh, you know, once again, we hear nothing is ever new in the United States between the shooters and, and <laughs> the arguments that we hear for building walls and uh, across the Mexican border or oh, excluding sure. anyone, any well, refugee from Syria. Or, or just uh, the idea I mean, it's that the same argu- It's the same argument. It is. Yeah, we, we could we could bring in you know a hundred thousand Syrian refugees who are fleeing for their lives, and uh, you know and someone will get up and say well one of them, one yeah. of those refugees uh, could shoot up a uh, a mall you know uh, and so and so we shouldn't let any of them in you know and we face these questions you know, yeah and, and as I say nothing nothing's ever new yeah you know? anytime somebody tells you something is unprecedented. Grab your wallet. <laughs> I want a t-shirt. Not in this that, country, anyway. <laughs> I, I want a t-shirt that says that anytime someone <laughs> says. Because I, I get sick of hearing that talking about words meaning things. I get mm-hmm. so sick of hearing, this is unprecedented. Really? I don't think yeah. so. I don't think that yeah. word means what you think I it mean, means. I mean, we have a president-elect who is crazy. We've never had such a thing. Oh, come on. Andrew Jackson? Richard Nixon with our president. <laughs> <I know. laughs> We've got Several that I can think of real how about, fast. How about Harding? I mean, it was a, it was a good one. Oh, yeah. man. Uh, there was, but, I, I, but then you look at Teddy Andrew, Andrew Johnson. How about Andrew Johnson? Yeah. No, I. Superb I, gun. But they, these people, of course, didn't <laughs> have a nuclear button. Nixon did. But, There's uh, that problem. This is true. Well, Nixon, Nixon did. Um, he, he was uh, too occupied with other things, bl- blowing up other things. He didn't, <laughs> he didn't have to put his finger. Well, and he was talking to China at the time. So. Yeah. yeah well, uh, hey, he's a very, uh-huh. he's a very complicated case. Actually. Yes, he uh, is. It looked, it looked very easy when I was five and watching the Watergate hearings with my parents, because yeah. I asked my <laughs> father what happened and he said, well, the president lied. And evidently, <laughs> and I'm, I don't remember this, but I looked at my father and said, well, didn't he say he was sorry? <laughs> and my dad said, no, actually, and that's part of the problem. Yeah. Always say you're sorry. Yeah. <laughs> well, I see, a, I see a, bulletin, a bulletin just came across my screen Uh-oh. that uh, the president-elect has appointed his son-in-law to a position in the White House. And uh, uh, should that be a First Amendment issue rather than a nepotism uh, question? I mean, shouldn't he be permitted to have as one of his mouthpieces, his son-in-law? Um, that, that is an interesting question, is when when can the First Amendment be superseded by other other laws? Because there's a nepotism. That, that's the issue we've been facing ever since 1789. Um, or, haven't we figured uh, this one out as yet? Hal, <laughs> as Hal said before, nothing's ever new. Uh, there, there is a... Um, you know, there has been a constant struggle since uh, in the 20th century to the present day about how you decide what the First Amendment covers and what it doesn't. Mm. Um, and the uh, uh, a famous professor at, uh, at Yale, uh, uh, Abe, uh, <laughs> Uh, My school. Thank you. I, I like I like to put it in terms of speech versus action. That yeah. the line wasn't. I mean, uh, Justice uh, Justice Holmes had originally formulated something that he himself came to realize didn't work very well, um, called the bad tendency test, which was if speech had a tendency to cause harm, then you could limit it. Ooh. And 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 then he reinterpreted his uh, his thinking about this and came up with something he called the uh, clear and present danger test. If there was a clear and present danger that something bad was going to follow from a speech, uh, from active speech, well, then the government could step in and prevent it. And that's the uh, shouting fire in a crowded theater. Yes, exactly. Yes. Uh, Got it. Now it makes and, sense. Um, and. and you 
you get to a point where there's, there's, there's a tendency on the part of, a bad tendency on the part of us all to want to find the right mm-hmm. compromise. Mm-hmm. So the notion that Congress shall make no law mm-hmm. doesn't sound very, you know, flexible. And it's not. Right. It's very clear on the words. Congress shall make no law. But then you get into respecting an establishment of religion and you have to start talking about, well, what is an establishment of religion and uh-huh. when does the law uh, respect it, quote unquote. Um, and because people are trying to find a way to do something to advance what they believe are good causes, but they fear that speech or religion or some other uh, aspect of the First Amendment or some other provision is mm-hmm. going to prevent them from, from taking these steps. And mm-hmm. so a lot of back and forth occurs, and there's a whole category of, quote, test called the balancing test. Oh, I don't know anything about this. You, I'm you, fascinated. You know, courts decide what the First Amendment limits what, um, on the basis of balancing different rights. Um, my, from my own point of view, most of those are false uh, equivalents. Mm-hmm. There, there really isn't anything to balance against Congress shall make no law. But you understand why people want to find a way if speech right. is harmful speech is harmful. It, yes. It I, I would say even, even more harmful than sticks and stones. Yes. Uh, I think somebody did come up with a statement to that effect. Uh, thank God. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I, I, I find words to be far more harmful. Yeah. I can take a bruise or broken something, but those words stick with you. They do. And do damage, real damage. Especially and and, and that may well, they're lies. Uh, you know, let's talk about lies. Yeah. Well, that's uh, that is in the in the context, for instance, in the context of our recent political campaign. Uh, you know, we've had a lot of discussion, a lot of revelations about so-called fake news and all of that. Well, um, shouldn't we prohibit that? How non-newspaper expert here? Uh, <laughs> they do harm. They, they do harm. I mean, the other candidate might have won the election. But for not as, not as much harm things, as, including including fake news. <laughs> yeah, not a, not as much harm as the tools that you would have to use in order to prevent them. That's what cause. I said to my yes. sister. Yes. That was that yes. was the argument I made to my sister. It, it's always an uphill argument. Let me tell you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, <I've> been, <laughs> Poor thing. Uh, I was um, uh, I was a student newspaper editor. That's how I got into this. Uh, dubious line of work. Uh, um, and I remember covering a meeting on campus and writing it up in 10 or 12 inches in the paper and running into one of my classmates outside. I don't even remember what the subject matter of the meeting was, but she was adamant that uh, I had completely screwed it up. Uh, she and I just weren't at the same meeting. And, and, and that's, that had, that, that problem has been with me ever since because mm-hmm. words mm-hmm. are um, damaging and uh, hurtful, uh, but they are also subject to interpretation. Yeah, and they're squishy. They're squishy. And what you choose out of a meeting when people say 10,000 words um, in a particular order, you're not going to, you're not going to print the whole meeting. They're not right. going to listen to every line like they do of this podcast, of course. Of course. Oh, well, <laughs> my God. But, but they, they're, if, I, if I were to give a, a verbatim transcript of that meeting, people would not, would not uh, it wouldn't help people to understand what happened there. And uh, even if I did give a verbatim transcript, they, they, you know, nobody, I, I can't put the language or the, the nuances into the description of what people said and how they said it. Well, we have to rely. Sense of what's happening. We have to rely upon our journalists to actually be journalists instead of propaganda machines. And there, there are certain. My son is he's sixteen and he's very very interested. Uh, I said, oh, it was something that I said about World War II, uh, the the effect that. Uh, 
newspapers were able to have during World War One and New and World War II. And he said, well, they were propaganda machines, mom. And I said, yes. And they were very effective by war bonds. I mean, this yeah. was, this was a, a familiar refrain. My grandmother lost her great grandmother's piano at the local air, actually Vandenberg air force base, not far from you. Um, she, she had loaned it to the, 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 what was it? The, not the USO center, but the, the on, on base officers club. Mm-hmm. And after the that war was, was over, her, yeah, yeah, well, that was serious, not the yeah. first one. But go, sure, the, go the try and get went, your piano back. Yeah, the piano went missing. It wasn't even there anymore. And I, I was horrified. And I said to her, oh, my God, didn't you go try and have them track it down? And her response was, well, no, it was for the boys. Hmm. I mean, that's what we did. That's what we did for the boys. We had victory gardens. We, we bought war bonds. We did what we could for the boys. And that was not a, a world that coming out of uh, Vietnam as a child existed for me. And, and the, the idea that post Watergate we could ever have experienced a, a, a moment in time where propaganda could be used so well by a, a group of people that are supposed to be journalists as as what we have seen maybe in the last 10 or 15 years um with the the upswing of the propaganda journalism again that uses that propaganda to cast aspersions on actual journalism where where people have you know facts that they cite well i find that very very hard to comprehend and to cope with and especially when it's framed as a first amendment right well first i would uh, remind us all that remind uh, me there is nothing new <laughs> 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 and that um, the newspaper industry um, prior to the second half of the 20th century was overwhelmingly uh, biased in the sense that newspapers had clear partisan identities right um, and right. Even in small towns, smaller cities at least, a town the size of my hometown in Illinois with 20, 20 30,000 people had more than one newspaper. But there was more uh, than one. Yes. But and each you knew one, who you were reading. E- exactly. E- but but that's, that's what we're doing today. We know yeah. who we're going to read and who we're going to blaspheme. <laughs> right. <laughs> and... Um, and so, and, and there's, there's a wonderful book about Lincoln and the press that was published mm. a couple of years ago. And the, the, uh, the games he played and mm. the games the press, particularly the New York press, people like Horace Greeley, um, right. played with him. Uh, and it makes modern interactions between the press and politicians look positively namby-pamby. I mean, yes, it, um, it was uh, it was vicious stuff. And oh, right. and when you go back to to even the prem much of the premise of uh, of the Hamilton musical, right, has to do with Hamilton's affair, yes. which was widely publicized and viciously publicized and by, by Jefferson. Yes. <laughs> so yes. uh, these things are always there. What you have to ultimately depend on is the the voters. And they are oh, often darn. wrong. They're often wrong. Yeah, yeah. And well, and and that's... I mean, getting in, getting information, getting information to those voters who ultimately decide some political office or another is a, it isn't one task. It's it's uh, uh, mm-hmm. the diversity of opinions, diversity of sources of information has never been greater than it is now. Uh, and yet, you know, in agreeing with Hal's point, if you go back and look at newspaper editions from just post-revolution up through Hamilton's time, well, and certainly around the Civil War, yellow it's, journalism. it's just appalling. Uh, sure, and the Hearst papers and, uh, you know, charge getting us involved in the uh, Spanish-American War. So why does um, it feel so, so different? Um, I don't know that it feels different to me. You know, I've been around 
a long time, probably too long, according to some people. Um, uh, but in in terms of you know very one sided uh, political stuff, uh, often untrue, published uh, whether it's published on uh, uh, in television news or what passes for a news program, but certainly on the internet. I mean, the stuff that comes across on the internet. That's oh, ridiculous. Uh, it's just some of it is just so appalling, and you 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 sort of hope well the person looking at this if he has an IQ or she has an IQ of a hundred is going to know this is nonsense, but that's not true. I mean, look at the yeah. charge against Hillary Clinton of, of, of running what what was this this child oh, this child sex sex ring at the sex pizza parlor. Ring? I mean, yeah, you, my, so you say my grandkids could, go to that pizza joint. They do. <laughs> 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 But you know, you said you said, how could anybody on earth credit credit that? That is such totally absurd nonsense. And yet, but it's well, it's the confirmation. People out there, there, there are a substantial number of people who believe this. Crap. It's confirmation bias, which um, unfortunately I I get. But it but it raises um, it raises one. I well, think. What should, what should we question. do that, that? Should we should we under the First Amendment? Say, uh, get rid of Congress shall make no law. Say, Congress shall uh, uh, be permitted to make laws out. No, but but it raises a historical absurd fake news. It is it it raises a very I think very important historical question because I'm seeing for me something that you just said to me, which is that you have the the kind of historical bandwidth to be able to recognize stuff as it's happening, and I just had this happen with my 16 year old where he said his friends are saying. Um, nobody responded to George or everybody responded the same way to George Bush that the same people are responding to Trump. And I said, that's not true. Your friends weren't there. There were people who were very unhappy with Trump getting or with Bush the second getting in. But nobody said any of the things that people are saying they are afraid of now when when Bush the second got in. That was just not nobody nobody was talking like the constitution was going to fall apart because somebody was going to come in and undermine it and i'm hearing that now and i know people were saying that during uh the gilded age that there were lots of problems with corporations and and big uh big money having an undue amount of influence on uh, both state and local and federal government and so i don't have a long view on this I don't know how we've gotten out of these situations in the past. I don't know how we were able to leverage the First Amendment without getting killed in a situation where there's somebody trying to pull an, uh, an uh, autocracy out of our democracy. Well, I almost wish that I had the sense that our new autocrat actually had a plan well, that's kind. the problem, isn't it? Other <laughs> people around him do. Of course they do. And their plans, um, I mean, the Congress's plans mm -hmm. are mm -hmm. uh, traditional Republican orthodoxy. New, yeah. new traditional. They're not Nixon or no, Reagan. Well, well, but they are, they are anti-Roosevelt. Okay, Yes. And it's it's the fight. We're still that. fighting the New Deal. Uh, yeah, they're yeah. still they're still fighting the New Deal, and okay. and they are very frustrated as we are frustrated that voters don't understand how awful it is that Medicare exists, and, and we're we're, okay. we're upset because voters don't understand what a tragedy Donald Trump's presidency promises to be. Right. Uh, what is wrong with these people? Why don't they get it? And, and the Republicans have, I, I used to think, I've sort of changed my mind about this, that, that Donald Trump was the answer to the Republicans' own inability to sell their, their package of programs to people that, who were going to be hurt by those programs. Yes. It's the what's and, the matter with Kansas thing. Yes, exactly. So um, I don't know. I... I and I am fundamentally an optimistic person and I, I just can't seem to quite kick it though. I get excited and my wife tells me, Oh, come on, calm down. You know, don't spoil the <laughs> breakfast table. Um, 
you my wife doesn't spoil. take that position at all. <laughs> yeah. You can spoil my <laughs> breakfast table anytime you want. <laughs> well, that was, you know, when the, the New York Times uh, uh, motto, all the news it's fit to print. Yes. They had a contest to get to that motto. And, and one of the entries was, it will not spoil the breakfast table. <laughs> <laughs> soil the bed, right? It will not soil the breakfast table. I love it. <laughs> That's but, but all the news won out. Uh, uh, whether it was a fair contest or not, I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> but the, the, the Republican, the, the, the Congress is going to try to repeal Obamacare. Now, they're already struggling. How are they going to do that? And, and not leave 20 million people uninsured because mm-hmm. they know they can't do that. Right. Uh, and, and they can't make it look like they let the Democrats win. So they've got to find some way Correct. to take it apart in a way that will benefit their ability to get elected. Well, and, and that's part of the freedom of the speech, the freedom of speech and, and of the press, right? Because it's how you leverage language. Yeah, I it's mean, it's how you. The death tax. I mean, they're perfectly. They're perfectly entitled. Yeah, how you manipulate the money. Discuss their point of view. Yeah, of the people. I mean, that's democracy. Yeah, uh, so it, it, it is a contest of ideas that we've had uh, uh, consistently, and, and I hope will continue as distinct from autocracy, where there is no contest of ideas. There is the idea of the autocrat, supported by his or her henchmen. Um, we don't have that, and I hope that we won't. But I, you know, um, I mean, I personally think is the day is going to come where there's going to be a great battle between the Republicans in Congress and their anointed leader uh, when they I disagree. I would love to be there to watch important. that. You I, will I would be. be fascinated. You will be because it's going because it's going to happen fairly soon. Uh, yeah. He whatever whatever he is. Uh, um, he is a person who believes that he's absolutely right. And if he decides, and he does decide these things, if he decides that some congressional action pushed by Mr. Ryan is contrary to what he believes in, uh, the battle lines will be drawn very, very carefully. And uh, he'll get what he wants because he's going to have all the power. Well, and that's that is a freedom of speech issue too. That I actually was talking about with again my sixteen year old who's taking all these classes, is um, when when you have freedom of speech for the people, and we all talk about it for us, and then you know children talk about I don't have any freedom of speech. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll talk well, I'll talk to the actual should, first sure, amendment should, lawyer they about they this. Have any. <laughs> they shouldn't have any. Because what did they know? Yeah, that's right. But, but when you teenagers should not have that, that right. And there there well, is there is to that question. There are there's a series of cases involving um, student um, speech, particularly under the age of eighteen. Student speech or college? Yeah, in in high schools, uh, actually. Sure. Um, sure. Um, there were, and and there were cases involving well, the most famous one uh, involved the wearing of black armbands to protest the Vietnam War in a Ooh. public high school. And uh, I actually went to, um, to college in Iowa. This, this incident occurred in Des Moines. Oh my uh, gosh. But I, I went to college with one of the sisters of the person who was, uh, her, their name was Tinker, uh, who was uh, thrown out of school for, for a black armband or wow. sanctioned in some way. I think she was thrown out. Uh, because it was disturbing the other students. Uh, I mean, the, the premise of controlling the security and quietude of the school system is something that deserves some attention. You don't want kids marching up and down the hallways. Um, and by the way, you can the government can restrict parades. Parade permits are permissible infringement on the First Amendment. You just have to be even-handed in how you do it. Right. Uh, schools, ideally. Have, yeah, ideally. Schools have a greater uh, uh, argument for uh, restricting speech within the school. You want your students to all feel safe. Yeah. But, like they can... for, but, but the, the courts have recognized that the First Amendment protects uh, reasonable uh, activities by students to assert their rights. So wearing, wearing an armband was considered 
okay, you you should be allowed to exhibit now, that. Kind now of you're going to now you're going to test my knowledge of <laughs> um, uh, tinker you versus you. whatever. But um, uh, I but it's believe an interesting yes, question. there was there was, whether 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 the tinkers were allowed to continue to wear their armbands or not. I honestly don't know the answer to. But I know that the decision, Supreme Court decision. Right. Um, crafted the test by which you could limit that student speech, and it was restricted. You couldn't just run a school the way Donald Trump wants to run America. Right. Uh, <laughs> so, right. Because uh, I say so, kind of. Yeah, because I say so. Yeah. And, um, but, but obviously, uh, what happens in kindergarten might be subject to stronger limitations than what happens for your 16 year old in high school. Well, it's, it's an interesting question about the, the, um, the maturity level of the people that you're talking about between kindergarten and, and high school and adult that the, um, when, when our student son was asking about, uh, why my husband and I have the reaction that we do towards a lot of television journalism. Um, I, while they were talking back and forth, I was going on to YouTube and I found the hour and 48 minute long segment of Cronkite between the point where he gets the report that Kennedy, something has happened to Kennedy in Dallas and they're covering the luncheon that he was supposed to show up at for the longest time. Mm -hmm. It's like listening to War of the Worlds. It's like, and now we cut to music. Yeah. Da, da, da. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, you know, eventually you start to watch Cronkite looking straight at the camera calm as a cucumber getting this document handed to him and this document handed to him and he doesn't break occasionally he'll put the glasses on and read something and then he'll come back and he has at least twice it has been reported that kennedy died during the course of this whole thing and it isn't until the last 30 seconds that he gets the coroner report and that's when his voice breaks yeah. and that's that moment that just kills you and even i mean our 16 year old went oh my god because he's been such a responsible grown-up for an hour and 48 minutes and and that one moment of emotion the split second of emotion that he lets through not on purpose is so telling when you've been watching an adult deal with the the enormous weight and responsibility of being the voice that is delivering the news not being a personality but being re responsible for letting all of america know what's going on and there isn't that that level of responsibility that i see for for the freedom of speech it's like i have a responsibility to say something that is reasoned and sane and uh, backed by facts the way that I find them. And that's going to be through my filter. And I'm perfectly happy to say that it's through my filter. But I don't understand where the, the like spitting cherry pits out of your mouth when you're a kid and you get all the cherry pits in your mouth and go, you know, <laughs> because it's fun and you, that's, you're great and it's a kid and woo. And I see adults doing that. And I don't, I don't have any way to process that. I don't know how to respond. I didn't know how to respond to those people in high school. Yeah. And I, I don't understand where our, where the first amendment comes down on that. And I, I, I would love to have you come back again another time, <laughs> Hal, and talk more about this. Cause there's a whole lot more to the first amendment than I thought there was. How we're going to have to study. If we're going to do this, we're actually going <laughs> to. Have to, yeah, have to hit the books. I'm gonna have to go get Tom. We're gonna have to book remember and read it. You know, <laughs> yeah. We're gonna have to remember the names of the cases and how they came out. I know. I mean, Heather, Heather, you're asking a lot here. Heather. You really are. Good. I mean, <laughs> I mean we don't mind. We it's don't mind showing than... up. We don't mind showing up with our respective ignorances. But if you're gonna make us <laughs> do it right, it's yeah. like Sudoku. It's good for us. Ah. Uh. <laughs> Well, this oh, is that, actually that how you're gonna... fun. So I don't it know if it was good for us or not, but it was it was it was fun. <laughs> well, this was this was great, and I'm very very serious. I would love to have you on again with with Abe and, and with me because I think there's, I mean, there's at least six different questions that we didn't even get to. And, <laughs> sure. And okay. there's 
I mean, you you look at you look at an amendment. You know the the first the first chunk of the the Bill of Rights, and it's only three clauses. But my God, there's so there's so much that this all touches. Yeah, we on. didn't even talk about religion. No, I'm no, sorry. we didn't even get close. Which is great because we've got a lot more to do then. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's talk about religion next time. Okay, <laughs> and and everything else. Thank you. It all, it all kind of does that. Mm. Thank you so much, Hal. Thank you, Abe, once again for for being my You're partner welcome. in crime. And um, Hal, I'll email you and and see when we can get you back on. Okay. Good. This would be great. Thank Thanks, you so Alan. much. Have a great Thank week. Thank you, Abe, for uh, putting me in this box. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my pleasure. I'll, I'll, Abe didn't want to be here alone anymore. <laughs> okay. Have a great week. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care.